Lord, you are so great, and I just want to thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord, and I thank you for dying on the cross and um, forgiving us for our sins, even though we don't deserve it, Lord, and I am so grateful that you are always with us, no matter what time a day it is or what we're going through, you are there standing by our side, guiding us through whatever hardship we may be going through. And I pray that we'll all just learn something from Pastor Robert as you get ready to speak through him. And thank you for everything you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. You turn on. There you go. Okay. All right. Ah, there you go. Let there be light. Now you can all read. So. Okay. It's all in the timing. It's all in the timing. Let me get my pointer out because we've got a map to look at tonight. Um, good evening. Or do you need good evening? You got to do it the same way. Come on. No, I'm kidding. Um. <laughs> you right. Um, so just to kind of start off with, uh, some people had asked me, uh, specifically one person in particular, Miss Miss Brenda, had asked me about uh, preparing a personal testimony, and we've actually got a, a a sheet here that is front and back, and it tells you <laughs> this is like the basics of doing a personal testimony like how to put scripture in it, um, do all those things. And then the other side actually says how to do a 10-second, 30-second, and 60-second testimony. Because some of you, you know, when you're, when you're getting into, hey, guys, some of you, when you're getting into certain situations with these things, you're like looking at it and going, you know, <clears throat> you're trying to give your whole life testimony in five minutes and you don't get even halfway through. So this will teach you how to, how to get it down to a manageable time that you can share with people. Because sometimes, you know, you've only got a minute at the bus station or something like that to, to share the gospel with somebody. And one of the things that Revelation tells us is that um, many people, especially in the, uh, in, in the last of days, um, the reason they're able to share the gospel and to overcome what's going on is by the word of the Lamb and the blood of their testimony. And so it's the idea of you having such a testimony that you know, you know, do you know how you're saved? Do you know what you believe? Do you know why you believe? And, and, and do you know how to formulate that into something that you tell people? So um, uh, we've already prayed for your sister, so... What, what, I didn't ask for anything. What is it you need? Um, I want to pray for everybody. Okay, we'll do that in a little bit, okay? All right, so Wednesday, uh, we're here, so we're doing it. So there you go. <laughs> Just remember, there is a want us for the kids in the back. Uh, reminder, this Saturday, the 12th, at... 11. And it's not, and it's not the 12th either, it's right? The it's the 4th. The 4th. At 11, right, uh, the 4th at 11, uh, this coming Saturday, we're going to have that look at the church. So if you'd like to see what the new place could possibly be, it's at 3033 West Harris behind Henry's, right? Most of you know Henry's. If you haven't eaten at Henry's or been by Henry's or driven by it, most of you know where it is. So... Uh, this coming Sunday is the Agape Feast and Communion. If you haven't had communion with us before, you know it's it's a um, we don't overdo it. It's not a it's not a big thing, but it is an act of obedience to the Word of God. The Word says we are to partake of communion um, as often as we can together, and it it's one of those things that connects us to to Christ and who He is. And um, you know it's just it's just a real blessing, and I love doing it with you guys. It's awesome. Um, so, <coughs> who do what? Oh, the theme is Mexican. It's Mexican, not Mexican. So, yeah, taco pizza, right? Huh? Yes, Mexican communion, yes. So, a little cinnamon and, uh, and chocolate, right? Yeah, and chocolate. So, 
Uh, okay, you heretics, that's enough. Um, uh, the tithes and offering boxes are by the exits. Please turn your phones to silent or off. Okay. So, uh, follow my own advice here. Get my timer ready for you guys. Um, and uh, the shoe boxes, the first truck went across. Uh, just a reminder, too, there was over 2,500 shoe boxes. That's the most that's been done in 12 or 14 years. So, bless the Lord. Um, and the first trailer has crossed, uh, and they fully expect the other ones to go across as well. <coughs> so, <clears throat> if you would, turn with me to Second Kings chapter 8. And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you right now, Lord Jesus. Uh, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you that we can look at your word. Um, Lord, as our sister asked, we just we pray for everybody. We lift up everybody, um, everybody here, everybody at the uh, um, <clears throat> uh, at the um, where, at their homes where they live. Uh, that you would bless them, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would just keep us all focused on you and looking at you, and we lift it all up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 8, we got as far as verse 6 last time, and we saw where the Shunammite widow, <clears throat> where literally she had come to a king uh, who was not really following God like he, like he should, who was not being obedient like he should, but when he was hearing all the miracles that God had done in Elijah and Elisha, and, um, and he was hearing testimony from people that it actually happened, it blew his mind so much. And then when this woman comes in, and he sees, you know, he's like, you know, there's her son who came back from the dead. Um, there's just all this craziness. And, and he was so blown away that he gave her, not just gave her her land back, she was like, hey, I want to buy it back. You know, because she had, you know, the prophet had told her, get out of Dodge until everything calms down. And then when she's coming back, she's like, hey, can I buy the land back to, you know, be part of our family? And, <clears throat> and the king said, not, not only will we give you the land back, we'll give you all the money it should have made while you were gone. Right? So not only did she get her land, she got her land plus the cha-ching, right? So uh, it was a real blessing to her. So, and now we come to verse 7, and we see Elisha is some of the harder things, you know, it's not, not like it's been easy for him up to this point, but some of the harder things that he has to do in his ministry are really coming up. And it says he went to Damascus, um, and remember Damascus is uh, in Syria, right, and it says, uh, Damascus and Ben Hadad, king of Syria, was sick, and it was told him, saying, "The man of God has come here." <clears throat> so Elisha's in Damascus. Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, is sick, and it just so happens that the man of God that heals everybody and brings everybody up, and the king said to um, uh, Hazael, "Take a present in your hand and go to meet the man of God. Inquire the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease?'" So uh, Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camel loads. Now, remember when Naaman went, he had how many? Like 11 or 12, right? So this guy is like, uh, hey, we heard Naaman had 10. We're going to have we're gonna have four times that much, right? Because this is the king of Syria, not just some nobody from, you know. So it's like, you know, they, they were like, we're going to bring the, we're going to bring everything. We're going to make this guy. And, you know, and maybe they're also figuring he's going to turn it down just like the last guy did so we can bring it back, you know, and just like he did with the last guy. So, you know, they bring him 40 camel loads, and he came and stood before him and said, your son, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, sent to me you saying, shall I recover from this disease? So he says, your son, right, even though he's not an Israelite, um, he, he's uh, not any of those things, you know, he says, your son, it's a, pre it's a, it's a place of, sub of subservience, right? He's putting himself underneath him. He's saying, you have authority over this person, okay? Uh, remember... For them, the, it was the same thing with the Romans. The Romans very much respected many of the laws of, of, of the Jews. 
and the Romans took it to the nth degree, but the, uh, the Romans called it the, the pater familias, which was the father of the family, which um, the, literally they, they held life and death over their children. If you as a son uh, didn't do everything you should, literally they could kill you. But the same thing was true even in the Jewish community, right? If a kid was bad enough, the father and the mother could go to the Jewish community and say, hey, our kid's a terrible person. You know, he's being everybody, he's doing all these things, and we'd like to bring him before the community and stone him to death. You know, that's the power that the father had over, over his family. So he's literally saying, you know, you have this authority over me. So, you know, and Elijah says to him, <clears throat> you know, so he says, shall I recover? Am I going to get healed? And Elisha said to him, verse 10, <coughs> go say to him, you shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. So it's like, so is this prophet telling this guy to lie? Is this, is this prophet telling him to go tell a lie? Or is this prophet telling him what he's going to say anyway? Right? The Lord has shown me he's going to die. And so then he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, why is my Lord weeping? So it says, he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed. Right? So literally, Elisha like, is looking at him, and he locks up. He's just locked into him. He's locked on, and he can't, and he knows everything that's about to happen. And you're going to see when he says this, it's like when he begins to weep, and he's looking at this man, it's because he's, he knows he's looking at a monster. He's looking at someone who is going to be one of the most brutal people to Israel that there ever has been. So Hazael says, why is my Lord weeping? He answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their stronghold you will set on fire. Their young men you will kill with the sword. And you will dash their children and rip open their women with child. So Hazael said, what is it? Is your servant a dog that he should do this gross thing? So he's just like, I'm a civilized man. I don't do these kind of things. Um, this is not how we operate in Syria, you know. And, and uh, Elisha answered and said, the Lord has shown me that you will become king over Syria. So, you know, and, and the person that he's talking to here is going to become the king Right, Hazael is going to become the king of Aram Damascus. And this is between 842 to 800 BC. So he's like king for like 40 years, which is a huge amount of time during this time. Um, and he was one of the most brutal of their enemies. Um, they found, you know, of course, there's the biblical sources here, but they've also found um, Assyrian sources that talk about him as a king and how brutal and how violent he was. Uh, and it's from an inscribed ivory fragment found at Arslan Tash among a booty that was seized by the Assyrians, which refers to him as our Lord Hazael. And from a cylinder seal found at Assur, which mentions, you know, a treasure that was taken um, um, to one of his royal cities. And, you know, this, this he was so violent and so horrible um, that... Uh, he literally did that. He would take and he would kill children. Um, he would cut them out of the women, uh, you know, while they were alive. You know, it was a horrible, horrible thing. Um, and that's one of the reasons that this prophet is looking at him and God reveals all these things to him. And he says, this man, it doesn't matter whether the king is going to be healed or not. This man's going to kill him. And that's exactly what happens. You know, Elijah answered, The Lord has shown me you will become king over Syria. Verse 14, Then he departed from Elisha and came to his master, and said, who said to him, What did Elisha say to you? He said, Oh, he told me you'll fully recover. But on the next day he took a thick cloth, dipped it in water, spread it over his face so that he died. And we know that that is literally a way that you can, you know, you can, you can smother somebody to death. Right, because it says they took a thick cloth, and remember, what was their usually their cloth was made out of what, huh? It was either made out of cotton or wool, right? 
and uh, wool when it gets wet and it gets dense, and they would mix it with other fabrics, and you know, so it, 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 you know, it was really easy to smother him with. So, uh, so he took a thick cloth and he covered over his face so that he died. Hazael reigned in his place. So, you know, so he literally says, you know, I, I don't think he encouraged him to lie. I think he just told him, you can tell him he's going to recover. And had Hazael chosen to not kill him, he would have recovered. But he said, you know, it's not the illness that's going to kill him. It's you. Right? And he knew that. He knew that was going to happen. He was like, you can tell him he's going to recover, but he's going to die. Okay? Because he knew what was going to happen. He was not telling him to lie to him. So don't think that for even a moment. Now, you know, so God keeps his promises, and we're going to see that now here beginning in verse 16. <laughs> even when we're kind of blowing it, okay? Now, in the fifth year of, of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, and remember, Ahab was a terrible king. He was an incredibly violent king. Um, he, you know, really you know, uh, uh, encouraged and pressed him and his wife. And what was his wife's name? Jezebel, Jezebel right? Um, you only name your really evil cats that, Right? I know people that have named their evil cats Jezebel. That cat's the worst cat I've ever seen. I'm calling her Jezebel, right? So, uh, you know, and uh, it's just, it's so evil. And the thing is, is you have to remember that this king, Ahab, you know, he's like so many in the world today. I mean, we have those that claim to be believers in Jesus Christ who stand in the place of either being a pastor or a priest or whatever you want to call them, bishops, elders, I don't care. And they stand in that place and they say that they are worshipers of Christ, they are teachers of Christ, but yet they teach sin, they promote sin, they live in sin, even in the midst of all these things. And you and I have to understand that that has happened, you know, I mean, we see it happening here. Here's the king of the northern kingdom um, called Israel, but it's not all of Israel. Remember, there's two kingdoms. There's Israel and Judah. Okay, so, you know, so it, it's, it's not, you know, and here he is, God appointed him and let him be there, and he had a choice, and he had a choice to commit evil, or he had a choice to do what was right, and he chose to commit evil. So, you know, Ahab is, you know, considered to be one of the most evil and terrible of kings, but Jehoram was his son. It says the son, you know, uh, having been king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, began to reign as king of Judah. So, you know, here is Joram, right? And then Jehoram is, is uh, the son of Jehoshaphat, is reigning as king of Judah. And it says in verse 17, he was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. And look at what it says, okay? So it begins to condemn him already by saying that he does what all the other kings have done, right? Not a good thing, because so far, all the kings of Israel have all taught everything else but, you know, the worship of the one true God. It says, you know, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, okay? So the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, having been king of Judah. But here we're talking about, you know, this was, you know, he is, he's married, you know, and the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay? So he's married into it. He's bound into it. Um, he, he's taking this woman that has been taught by her mother how to reject God, how to, how to, how to you know, worship everything but him, and, and now it's his wife. Um, and it says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And you guys got to remember that. We've got to keep that in mind. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So you and I need to understand, God does not approve of the sin of these people. We read these things and we go, you know, why are all these terrible people made into leaders and done all these things? And it's like, why did people vote, you know, on the way they did in the last thing, right? It's because 
that's, you know, that's what people do sometimes. Um, why is it sometimes it seems like the best of people that have the greatest of intentions yet commit some of the worst acts that we see? You know, um, it, it's, you know, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. One of the things that we, they have lost at this point, remember, they made their own religion up. They said, we understand how, how we're supposed to worship God, but we really want to do it this way. And we think it's a really good way. And, and this is how we want to do it. And, you know, God's so gracious and merciful. He'll be cool with it. Right. And that's kind of how our, our, our modern pluralistic society has become. You know, we've got, you know, we've got people who say that they, you know, they claim to be Christians. And yet um, Jesus is not their Lord. You know, he's their buddy, their pal. He's their anything but Lord. And you and I need to understand, you know, that, you know, here he did evil in the sight of the Lord because he promoted the worship of anything but. Remember what we talked about Sunday, right? When we looked at Revelation and we saw what happened in the book of Revelation as this system that we're talking about here with him is completely obliterated in the last days of the Great Tribulation. You know, and literally the Bible says over and over again to worship anything but Christ, to worship anything but God, is to worship demons. You know, and it's like, it's not, and people, I don't think, there are some very good people that reject God. You know, and that's just how it is. You know, you and I have to understand Heaven is not going to be filled with good people, right? It's going to be filled with sinners that have been saved by grace, that have accepted the mercy, grace, and what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross. I mean, I'm going to be there, so you know it's not good people, right? You know? I know some of you are going to be there, so I know that too, okay? So it's not about you earning points or being good enough, you know, or, you know, hey, it was, you know, it's not about being the great person. It's about trusting the great person. It's about trusting that one that did it. And Ahab does not love God. And it shows in how he lives and what he does. And in verse 19, the Lord would not destroy Judah, okay? He keeps his promises, the Lord would not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David, as he promised him to give him a lamp and his sons forever. So the whole reason he's doing this is to keep the line of David going, to keep everything happening here. Okay? So, uh, and this is talking, I think this is talking about the king of Judah, right? Yeah, this is talking about the king of Judah. So, you know, and so in his days, Edom revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. All right, so now here, you know, uh, uh, Edom is revolted against uh, Judah's authority because remember, that was the uh, was it tribe of Manasseh, I think, that was uh, over Edom and had them in it. I, you know, I can't remember at the, at the moment, but... Um, but there was one of the tribes that was over that area, and the Edomites, God had said, don't wipe them out, don't do that thing. But here now, they're going to rebel against them. You know, and here this king, Joram, went to Zaire, okay, verse 21. So Joram went to Zaire, all his chariots with him, and he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who had surrounded him. And the captains of the chariots and the troops fled to their tents. Thus, Edom has been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day. And Libna revolted at that time too. So it's like, you know, once everybody saw that this little measly tribe called the Edomites could revolt against the king and win, they are like, oh, hey, let's us do it too, right? There's nothing like uh, uh, people revolting and getting mad and saying, I'm not going to follow that person. I'm not going to follow that king. And then everybody goes, uh, yeah, we're not either. Why are we yelling, right? And, you know, they don't even have a reason to do it, but if everybody else is revolting, it must be revolting, right? So let's revolt, you know? Hey, they're burning cars. Literally, we saw that happen when I was in the Navy. We were in Italy, and we were walking around, and literally within seconds, man, I tell you, it was in seconds, they were painting American flags on the side of cars and lighting them on fire, smashing windows out, and and it just happened like it was almost like a fire of people, right? The people caught on fire in their hearts and in their heads, and then it came out, you know? And, and it's like that's one of the things that happens here. They begin to revolt, and uh, and if you lose...
choose your place of where you're worshiping God, where you see your authority, where you recognize who it is that, you know, like I know I'm here and God has placed me here and he's placed me here as pastor, but I am not the Lord of anything. I don't rule anyone. I'm not the king of anything, right? You're his. You belong to him, right? You're made in his image, not Robert's image, you know? My kids might be able to claim that a little bit, you know? And if you see my kids, you'll be like, that's his baby, right? You know that for sure, okay? But here's the thing, you know, God has done this, and these kings have lost their authority. They have lost their place. They have, you know, um, and they think that they can get away with, uh, with, you know, being their own source of authority and who they are, but you can't. You can't keep claiming Christ and, and living like the devil, and that's exactly what's going on here. So since they've rejected their source and authority, God has removed his hand from them, and now they're paying the price for that. And it tells us that the rest of the acts of Joram, so literally that was like the highlights. You know what I'm saying? So how would you like that to be your highlight reel, you know? Now the rest of the acts of Joram and all he did are, and they're not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So Joram rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. So this is going forwards and backwards and all these times cross over. And since I'm not doing an in-depth, I'm not going to put up like a time chronicle so you see how how the times work out with the kings and where they're at. I would just encourage you, some of you may have charts in your Bible or if you have a good study Bible, it can kind of show you um, um, how the, the reign of the different kings did. So I just encourage you to do that. Um, now look with me at... Verse 25, okay? So, we've got Ben-Hadad, and then we had Jehoram, and then we had Joram, and now we've got Ahaziah. So, in the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, so this is, you know, Joram had a son named Ahaziah, and so Joram, you know, Jehoram also does too. Ahaziah was 20, I'm sorry. Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, began to reign. Okay, Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, the king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab. You know, so it's like, They're marrying each other's daughters off to one another. It binds them together, you know, politically, socially. And it says, And he walked in the ways of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab. For he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. So he literally marries into it as well. He, you know, this is just, you know, uh, uh, again, it's that corrupt influence. Um, You know, it's like they'll, you know, like when you get married to someone, they'll say, "Go, go look at the, the mother, and that's, you know, that's, that's who you're marrying, right? You know, so, and it says, uh, He went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Hazael, the king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram. Then King Joram went back to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which the Syrians had inflicted on him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, the king of Syria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab in Jezreel, because he was sick. Is everybody thoroughly confused now? Okay. All right. So, so basically, Joram, right, is the king of Israel. Okay, and it, you know it, it sounds confusing, and there's a lot of back and forths in this. Okay, because you know it's like there was Joram son of, there was Jehoram son of, and they all share names. They all you know get named in the honor of, and they get named in the honor of, and you know don't get too confused with the names. Just kind of look at. Who's king of what? Where they're king at? And what's going on? And then we, you know, it basically took us about 20 years up. And now we're going to jump back because it says, you know, you know, Joram went back to Jezreel to recover from the wounds 
um, which the Syrians had inflicted on him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, the king of Syria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab in Israel, because he was sick. So he goes to visit him, you know, to minister to him, to, you know, bring his doctors and physicians and, you know, we'll bring our leeches down there and they can suck on your blood and do all that stuff and, you know, all the craziness that they would do. Um, and, you know, we won't go into the medicines of uh, the 8th century, right, or the 7th century. Bloodletting, uh, lots of weird human parts and pieces that would be thrown into it. Um, urine was a big ingredient uh, from every animal on the spectrum, including humans. Uh, excrement, everything else was used as medicine. So your doctor would come in with a big pack of stuff that was guaranteed to kill you and put it on your wound and say, you know, th th this is approved. Um, it's science, people. Until it's not. It, yes, it's FDA approved. So anyway, it, it would definitely kill COVID. Right? The moment you die, COVID's done. It, Hillary will kill COVID, yes. One day. Um, <laughs> all right, you sinners, stop it. Um, so, so all this is going on. Everything's happening. Uh, everybody's sons is named after everybody else. And then here's what happens in, se in 2 Kings chapter 9. So let's, let's get through this, shall we? <laughs> then it gets interesting. Okay, all, all, all these things are happening. Um, he's given us this picture of good kings, bad kings. Uh, it's, all, it's all pretty much bad, but then the story changes. Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, um, all right, so, you know, he, he's going to, uh, um, he's going to delegate, right? It's, and it's good, right? Especially when you're going to like do something weird or dangerous, it's always good to be able to get somebody else to go in and do it, right? So he says, you know, get yourself, right? You're going you're gonna to get everything ready. Um, literally, the word that he uses here, get yourself ready, he says, gird your loins, okay? And you and I hear that, and it automatically becomes a giggle joke, right? But all it really means is he takes the back part of his robe, lifts it up between his legs, tucks it into his belt so he can run. All right? And there's a reason for this. He says, get yourself ready. Take this flask of oil in your hand. Go to Ramoth Gilead. So do me a favor. Put up that map. I have my handy pointing device here. Okay, because you guys can't really read it. Okay? Here's Jezreel. All right? And, and, and that's where Jezebel... And uh, I think Joram are, and Ahaziah uh, is all the way down here from Jerusalem, okay? So he says you're going to get up and you're going to go to Ramoth Gilead, which is all the way over here, all right? And then here's Samaria, which is the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, all right? Down here in this little green area, that's Judah, okay? So Ramoth Gilead is where... He tells them to go, okay? So you guys could find your way in Israel now. You're good to go. Yeah. <clears throat> so he says, take this, go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive at that place, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat. Jumping Jehoshaphats, right? The son of Nimshi. And go in and, and, and make him rise up from among his associates. Take him to an inner room. So he's like, when you get there, you're going to find him. Take him to an inner place. Take him someplace in private. Okay? <clears throat> then take the flask of oil, pour it on his head, and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and run. <laughs> so it's almost like, you're king of Israel now. Bye. Right? He says, go, run, flee, okay? And there's a reason for this, okay? Because literally when this happens, everything changes um, um, in Jehu and what he does. So, um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of crazy what's about to happen here, okay? So, 
you know, imagine if you're the prophet, you know, it's, it's like you're just in school, right? I'm just going to prophet school. I'm just looking to get my prophet certificate. And now this guy says, I got to go do this. But it's also an honor because God is choosing you. God is, has this prophet. The prophet's not, I, I really don't think Elisha's just bailing. He's literally chosen this person to go do this, right? It's an honor. So, the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, all the way up there. You can leave that map up there for me, just so we can kind of see it. Yeah, I should have chopped off some of it there. I'm still getting that right. I'll get it better for you next time. So, that's all the way to, the, to your right there, um, you know, at the end of the line on that red line right there. So, he goes all, to, all the way to Ramoth Gilead, Okay. And when he arrived, there were the captains of the army sitting. Whose army? Israel's. Okay? So this guy, he is a leader in the army of Israel. Okay? There were the captains of the army sitting. And he said, I have a message for you, commander. So this guy is a, a commander in the army of Israel. And Jehu says, for which one of us? And he says, for you, commander. So it's like, I have a message for you, Commander. So everybody's coming. Bye, girls. Y'all have a blessed night. So, and then he says, I have a message for you, Commander. He rose, went into the house. He poured the oil on his head, and he said to him. So we see there's a bit more of a message here than just what was said by Elisha. And, I, you know, in this, you know, the scripture that's given to us here. This is God speaking through this young man or this man uh, who has been chosen to do this. And he says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. Now, the difference by the difference between this person and David is God issues a literal command for him to take the enemy out. Okay? Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. You shall, so notice, the people of Israel or the people of the Lord, okay? So remember, they're his. They, you know, and God is always saying, you know, they're the apple of my eye. These are my people. These are my people. And he calls you the same. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, he calls you his. You know, he literally says, not only does he call you his, but he will never leave you, never forsake you. And and that's just amazing to me that here God says, you know, over the people of the Lord, over Israel, you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master. You know, so he's literally given the command, you know, Ahab is to be removed, that I may avenge. You know, and who's the house of Ahab? It's both these kings. Because remember, one is married into it, and one is the son of. One is the son of Ahab, and the other one married the daughter of Ahab. So they're all part of the family. And Ahab had been promised that his family was not going to keep getting it. Okay? All right? So look at what happens here. All right? He says... You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. Verse 8. I will cut off from Ahab all the males in Israel, both bond and free. So he, he literally commands and he says, Listen, not a single man shall remain faithful to the house of Ahab. Not a single man would be claimed by that. If there is a male who claims to be of the house of Ahab, you're going to kill him. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. The dog shall eat Jezebel on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So he literally... He's, he's being obedient, right? Every time a prophet is not obedient, there's a cost and there's a price to be paid. So, you know, if you laid that kind of heavy message on somebody that was literally a king, you know, it's like, okay, he's literally a commander in this guy's army. He's sworn himself to this king. Now he gets a command saying, you're the king now. Go kill the king. And then kill the other king too. Anybody that's Ahabian, get rid of him, 
right? And then he bails. He, he literally runs. Then Jehu came out to the servants of his master, and one said to him, Is all well? Why did this madman come to you? So remember, this guy comes in, loins all girded up, right? Girded loin man! Ah! I got a bottle of oil. Where's, where's Jehu? You know, all right, commander, commander, I got a, you know, and he's like, which commander? He's like, you, 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 right? And then he goes into the room with him and then bails out of the door, right? He just, hey, you know, crazy prophet, right? And then they're like, what is this madman? What has he done with you? What's happened here? Okay. All right. So Jehu says, you know, the man in his babble, Right? Because that was one of the things they would say of the prophets. Because sometimes the prophets would be caught up in the spirit and they would murmur things. They would babble things. They would, you know, they would repeat the scriptures over and over. They would repeat the commands of the Lord. They would do halals, which is, you know, it's where we get the word hallelujah from. It's to praise God. And sometimes they would just do it, you know. And you guys, man, if you've been caught up in the spirit, sometimes... You'll be at home or you'll be somewhere or especially all you crazies who are on the radio in your car, right? And you will just get swept up, man, praising the Lord, you know, making that joyful noise. And some of you, it's more than just noise, right? And it's like, you know, even angels grit their teeth when some of us sing. But man, he loves it when we do. You know, your father wants to hear your voice, he, he, you know, and that's a way that you love him. But he says, ah, you know these prophets and their babble, you know. And they said, it's a lie. They realize something of import has just happened here. They know something's going on. And he's like, you know, he uses a, 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 an inflection, you know, it's like a Hebrew inflection, just like, you know, ah, you know, you know, blah de blah you know, like we would say. He said, blah, 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 and he spoke to me saying, thus says the Lord, I've anointed you king over Israel. So that's literally what this guy does. He's like, you know, he's like, blah, 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 blah. He said a bunch of stuff, and then he said, I'm king. Right? Then each man hastened to take his garment, put it under him on the top of the steps, and they blew trumpets saying, Jehu is king. Okay? They know this is right. They know Jehu Intimately, he's the, one of their commanders. He stands with them as captains of the army. And now they realize he's their king. And every single one of them says, you're the guy. Okay? So he's definitely got everybody's hearts. Now, as we get ready to read these things and we see God judging these, uh, these, uh, these kings and these people, right, including Jezebel, just want you to understand um, um, Jehu starts out as an instrument by God that is used to rebuke, to punish, and to bring people into order. But then he begins to believe his own press, right? He begins to get caught up in the idea that you know, that many do um, who think that, you know, now that I'm in this power, now that I'm where I'm at, I can do what I want. I've got all the power. I can, you know, I can make all the decisions. And that punishment comes in. Um, Hosea chapter 1, verses 4 through 5 says this, uh, The Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while um, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. So literally the house of Jehu, they take everything to the nth degree. And it's like, well, the Lord told me to punish it, so now I'm going to wipe out just anybody that had anything to do with them. And so he begins to slaughter the people of Israel and Judah and and, and, and it's just, it's mind-blowing. Liz, can you turn the AC down a little bit? Everybody's putting jackets on and grabbing blankets. So, um, yeah, we can't go by her, right? Because I'm, I'm just messing with you, messing with you. I know. I asked you to turn it on, not not refrigerator level. Um, but... You know, uh, but let me finish Hosea for you. It says, And bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. You know, so it's like, you know, even God realized, you know, he, he, he commits that Jehu is going to take everything. He just takes it too far. Um, so, <clears throat> Jehu, verse 14 the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, he conspired against Joram. Now Joram had been defending Ramoth Gilead, he and all of his Israel against Hazael, king of Syria, because Syria is just on the other side of that, to the north. 
All right. So it's like they've been up there defending against the Syrians. And, you know, Joram had been there and he had left. So he says, um, and he said, and Jehu said, if you are so minded, let no one leave or escape from the city to go and tell it in Jezreel. So Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. So remember, as we're going to look at this, this is Ramoth Gilead, okay? And then this is Jezreel, all right? So he's riding in his chariot all the way over here, which, you know, and then Megiddo is where, who stays in Megiddo? Elisha. Okay, that's where, that's where, that's where his hooch is. So, so now, okay, so he's riding, you know, and, and, and he's going. Jehu rode in a chariot, went to Jezreel for Joram, it tells us was laid up there, verse 16. And Ahaziah, the king of Judah, had come down to see Joram, remember? Okay, why does it say, why does it say Ahaziah, the king of Judah, had come down to see Jordan? Do you know why? Right. Even though, in terms of, like, elevation, you know, these the mountains that he has to cross and where he has to go... Everything is considered down when you're coming from Jerusalem, right? For the Jews, to Jerusalem was the pinnacle. That was the place. That was where God's, you know, temple was, okay? So he says, you know, he had come down to visit him, all right? Now, watchmen stood in the tower of Jezreel, okay? So he's in Jezreel. He's, you know, he's hurt. He's injured, and this watchman is at the tower, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came. And he's like, hey, I see some guys coming, right? I just imagine, I see a company of men. Uh, it, it's just, it, it reads so weird to me that, you know, he's not expecting this. He's, he's kind of like, he, he, it's almost scary to him. And Joram said, get a horse and send him to meet them and let him say, is it peace? So the horseman went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? <coughs> and Jehu said, what, do you ha- what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So, you know, he basically says, You know, this has nothing to do with peace. Turn around, follow me. So he's like, Fall in behind me. That's right. You join me. The watchman reported, saying, the messenger went to them, and he is not coming back. You know, guy realizes what happens, right? He hears the word, Jehu's king now. And, he, and he's, you know, he's, he's coming. To, uh, there's a reckoning about to happen. Sit on, sit on a second horseman who came to them and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered, what, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So the watchman reported, saying, He went up to them and is not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. He drives like a crazy man. Right? And it's like everybody would know. You know, it's like that. Um, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I had an uncle, and I can't remember if it was my uncle Irving or my uncle David. But one of them, when you'd see him driving and you'd see him coming down the road, you'd know who it was. Because I can't remember if it was my uncle Irving or my uncle David. But especially if you were on like a long dirt road, because you'd see the column of smoke from the car going like this, and you'd be like, oh, it's it's Irving. Right? Because... He was one of those guys, if he looked to the side, that's where the car went, right? So wherever he looked, that's where the car would go, all right? So you couldn't say, hey, look, a deer, because you'd end up in the ditch, right? <laughs> so, my, so, you know, if he, if he drifted, if he looked over and started talking to you, he was going to end up, you know, hitting curbs and stuff like that. So, but this is the same kind of thing. It's like, hey, he's driving like Jehu does. Jehu drives everywhere crazy, all right? And he always drives like he's a madman, like he's just... And then Joram said, make ready 
And his chariot was made ready, and Joram the king of Israel, and Ahaziah the king of Judah went out, each in his chariot. Right? We're not buddy driving here. It's like everybody's got their own chariot because I'm the king, and I'm a king, and we all drive in our own chariots. And they went out to meet Jehu and met him on the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. What happened at the vineyard of Naboth? Do you, do you remember what happened? Right. That's right. Yeah, because Ahab had wanted a vineyard there. Okay? And Ahab, when he wanted that vineyard, and Naboth went and sell it to him, and Jezebel said, just kill him and take it. Right? Find a reason. You're the king. You can do whatever you want. That's what we tell ourselves sometimes, right? I mean, Burger King said you're the king. You know, have it your way. Right? And... Ahab did it, and now in this same place, and this isn't the first time this vineyard's come into play, right? Um, a lot of things have happened here, and here they meet at this same vineyard. And remember, this is, this is where Ahab had committed one of his atrocities, so much so that the Bible literally you know, gave it to us in that story form, and now his, the judgment of his family, the prophecies that had been made to him and his family are coming to play right here in this place. Now it happened when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? You know, so he's basically saying, is the war over in Syria? Are we good? So he answered, what peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? So what King should have been saying since the beginning, now this person speaks up. And to everybody else that hears it, they're just like, <gasps> Right? That's one of the things you would do, right? He just called his mama a harlot. Right? That's like somebody calling your mother, you know, yeah, you're prostitute of a mother. I mean, most of you don't talk to my mama. You don't talk about my mama like that. You don't talk about anybody's mama like that. And he's just, he lays it out. Because this is a judgment of God. Okay? This is a judgment of God. So, <clears throat> Joram turned around and ran. <laughs> he does. He just, you know, he said, he, so read verse 22 again. When Joram saw Jay, is it peace, Jay? And he answered, what peace? You know, there cannot literally be peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. Joram turned around and fled and said to Ahaziah, treachery, Ahaziah. Right? So he's like, it's a trap. Right? That's exactly what he does. It's a trap. Run. Okay? It's a trap, run. And Jehu drew his bow with full strength and shot Jehoram between his arms and the arrow sank, came out of his heart. And, you know, so the arrow came out of his, out, at, at his heart and he sank down in his chariots. Insta-kill, okay? Right? Boom. You know, he's like the sniper and he's on a chariot too. That's pretty impressive, you know? Because this dude's like, run, run, run! And then whack. You know, he's done. He's down. So Jehu said to Bidkar, his captain, pick him up, throw him in the tract in the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So he's, he says, take his body, throw it in the field. Because that's the same field that his dad committed an atrocity in. This is a judgment against the family, right? Um, for remember, when you and I were riding together behind Ahab, his father, that the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this plot, says the Lord. Now therefore take and throw him on the ground according to the word of the Lord. But then Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this. He fled by the road to Beth Hagan. So Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also in the chariot. So they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is by Ibleam, and he fled to Megiddo, so he's trying to get to the prophet, and he died there. And his servants carried him to the chariot of Jerusalem, buried him in the tomb with his fathers in the city of David. So his, you know, he wasn't given the same treatment as <coughs> Jehoram was. So in the eleventh year of Joram, the king of Ahab, Ahaziah had become king over Judah. And then Jezebel, right? Verse 30, okay? <clears throat> so when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes, adorned her head, and looked through a window. Okay, now she's old at this time. 
right? So to me, it's like, um, you know, I imagine one of those old Hollywood actresses, right? Uh, if you've ever seen like the Carol Burnett show, I picture her kind of like as Carol Bur- Burnett coming out uh, doing, you know, and I know that's weird for some of you, you're like, who's Carol Burnett? <laughs> Comedian, hilarious to the nth degree. And uh, she dresses up like old Harley, Hollywood starlets, right, with all the weird makeup and the huge hair and all that good stuff and, you know, the six-foot-long lashes. And that's kind of what Jeze- Jezebel is putting on her face, okay? She, this is who she is. As Jehu entered the gate, right, so she's trying to, you know, be the queen. As Jehu entered at the gate, she said, Is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? And he looked up at the window, right? Doesn't even address, doesn't even engage. He looked up at the window and he said, Who is on my side? Who? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him. So basically people that had to serve in the house of... um uh, of Jezebel, the men that had to serve there literally were eunuchs. And if you know what a eunuch is, it means they've been castrated. Okay? And and it means they, um, I mean, it, and it's not just like most of the people do here with bulls and stuff like that. It's everything. It's everything. You know? Everything is completely and utterly removed. Um, and, and here, right, these eunuchs looked down, and two or three eunuchs looked at him, and he said, throw her down. And without hesitation, they threw her down. Some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. That's, that's violent. That's, you know, and, and, it's, and it's a horrific sight that you see going on here. When he'd gone in, he ate and drank. So he literally runs over this woman's body. This Jehu is violent, you know, you know, reminiscent of David in some of those ways. David was violent, right? And when he had gone in, he ate and drank. So after lunch, he says, go now, see to this accursed woman and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they came back and told him and said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elisha, the Tishbite, saying, On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. So literally while they're inside and he's eating lunch, the dogs are outside ravaging what's left of her body. Yeah, kind of like piranhas, right? But that's one of the reasons that dogs were considered unclean. They would literally, if people died, they would eat them. You know, if you've got a dog that loves you so much, if you die in the house and that dog gets hungry, you're getting your, you know, your puppy chow, right? It's just going to happen, okay? Dogs will eat anything and roll in anything. If you've got a dog, you know, it's, they'll puke and then lick it right back up. Dog returns to his own vomit. It's just what they do. And dogs are nasty, and that's why they were considered unclean, because they would eat everything, especially dead stuff. So, um, you know, they came back and told him, and, and he says that, and then the corpse of Jezebel, verse 37, shall be as refuse on the surface of the field and the plot at Jezreel, so they shall not say, here lies Jezebel. So he's literally like, go use the rest of it as, as fertilizer in the field. You know, and, and we don't want anybody visiting her graveside. There's, there's nothing now. Okay, God's done a judgment here. He's made his, he's made his way plain. And then, you know, you and I, as we look at this and, and we see the violence here, um, you know, God has given so much time for repentance. All these guys, you know, they, they know what they're supposed to do. They have the word of God. They have the Torah. You know, um, they have the writings of the prophets up to this point. Um, you know, they know what has been commanded of them. And you and I, you know, we go, well, they, they might know, know everything. Listen, we are given the highlights in the scripture. I guarantee you these prophets spoke to all these kings, and we see it a few times even in, in here in Second Kings, where literally they are 
condemned for their behaviors and the choices that they're doing. Literally, the word of God that they all have before them, most of them walk out with scrolls, put them down, and then just do what they want. Right? It's kind of like how people do nowadays. We read the Bible, and then we go, eh, but, you know, hey, that was for back then. This is now. You know, they're the same way. Right? It, all, all the corruption we see in the church and, you know, in, in, in people abusing the word of God and everything is no different now than it was back then. It's not. It, you know, it, it's the same. As a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 2, <clears throat> if you want to turn there, you can. In Revelation chapter 2, because, you know, God even uses Jezebel, um, you know, as a sort of a symbol but yet, you know, it, the, the spirit of Jezebel is that spirit of blasphemy, that spirit of turning against God. Revelation chapter 2, look at verse 18 with me. And this is, this is Jesus himself speaking to Thyatira. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, there in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, he says, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. He's like, you guys are doing more than you did when everything first started. Nevertheless, <laughs> I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. So he literally calls this person Jezebel. You know, whether that was her name or not, or whether that was going on. But he uses that terminology because it's the exact same thing. It's leading from the worship of God and it's leading people in a way. And what does, he, what does she use? He says, she calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So listen, he is talking to the church here, right? And we know when the early church was given by... You know, remember, he said, don't eat, don't eat blood, right? Things strangled, and don't eat things that are sacrificed to idols, okay? That was the commands that were given to the Gentiles that were coming into the early church. And, and then don't commit sexual immorality. Because that was huge for the Gentiles, right? That was just one of the things that was like, that was a form of worship in many of the Gentile, you know, in, in many of the pagan religions, okay? So he literally says... If somebody's teaching you, right, if somebody's seducing you to commit sexual immorality, how many churches do we have today that are, and, and I heard somebody say this, and I thought it was really good. Um, if the conversation about whether homosexuality is, sin, is a sin begins in your church, get out of that church. Because there, the word of God says it's a sin. If somebody says, well, is fornication really bad? Yeah, it is. It's literally commanded against in the scripture, right? It's, that's like saying, is it really bad for you to have an idol in your home? You'd be like, well, yeah. Most of us would kind of blow it off and go, nah, it's like an archaeological religious, you know, it's not religious, you know. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm really into art, you know. And, and it's like, no, 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 no. It's idolatry. And here he says they teach and seduce, my, notice it's teaching. They're teaching the corruption of the Word of God. They're teaching people to become corrupt and to do these things. And it starts with, it's that, se it's that sexual immorality and it's idolatry. It's leading to idolatry. And it says, I gave her time to repent, in verse 21, of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, remember, we talked about this this past Sunday too, right? The difference between fornication and adultery and the fact that when it's called adultery in that spiritual sense as well in the real sense, right? God compares that adultery to your mind and yet you're cheating on me. You know, because most of us are, would not be happy with our significant other who has committed themselves to us for life to just, you know, hanging out with anybody they wanted to. You'd be like, that's going to be a no for me. You know, most of us wouldn't be happy with that, 
right? Unless you're really weird and seduced into this stuff, okay? So, you know, and, and it's like, and it says literally, those who commit adultery with her will be taken into the great tribulation. You got to understand, there's going to be a lot of people, right, in churches when everything goes, and many of us are going to be gone, right? And your relationship with Christ is going to determine that. And when that happens, there's going to be a lot of churches with a lot of people going, where'd everybody go? Uh huh. Yeah. I'm just living with my girlfriend. It's not a big deal. You know, I mean, we really love each other. We're just not ready to get married yet. Right? I, I'm in a monogamous you know, relationship with my man, and I'm a man. You know, I've literally had people tell me, you know, if I if I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, will I have to leave my girlfriend? And this was a girl asking me this. And I said, yes. She said, then I'm not doing it. Right? I would rather go to hell than leave her. And they would not repent of their deeds. Remember, there's going to be people literally in the great tribulation as all these things are cratering down who will still not repent. Oh, God, it's all your fault. You know, and, you know, they never take responsibility or accountability for themselves. He says, I will, and literally he says in verse 23, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. So he says, I'll just kill them all. Right? I'll kill them all. And you'll know it's me doing it. And we know that's going to happen in the scriptures, in the great tribulation. So he says, when you go to the great tribulation, you're all going to die, and everybody's going to know you were not mine. Right? He says, I will give each to you according to your works. Now, as you, uh, you know, and now to you I say, and this to the rest in Thyatira, as many as who do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. And what was that burden? Do not accept their teaching. Do not accept what they teach. Reject this, this philosophy, this idolatry, this doctrine that she is putting out. And it's not just her, and it's not just women. It's that, remember, it's that system of idolatry, you know? And, and, and it's that false worship that goes against God. And he says, but hold fast to what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works till the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, uh, as I also have received him from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So you and I, as we see this thing happening here in Second Kings, we have to know that God has revealed it to us then so that we see it now. So we see that same system that we saw in, in Revelation chapter 18, right? And, and I'm, I'm, about, I'm, I'm about to close it down, guys. I'm closing it down. I promise. Okay? In Revelation chapter 18, right, where we saw the scarlet woman destroyed where we saw that system of false worship completely eradicated and, and, and thrown into the sea, as it were. There was no more, and, and it was called the great city Babylon then. Okay? So this, this is going to happen. This is going to end. God is going to judge, and he is going to have his way. And just as he judged then, um, he, he's going to judge now and in the future, and when he does, it's going to be complete and utter. So pray with me if you would. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this, your word. And I just pray, Lord, that um, as we study and work with you in this, that you have your way in us, that you, Lord, um, move upon us, uh, and that we would see, Lord, we need to follow after you, that we need to not make it up as we go, that we need to, the Bible says, to, st to be diligent to show ourselves approved before God, Lord. We need to be into your word. We need to be studying you, learning about you. Um, we need to be that iron sharpening iron with each other. We need to be finding out what it is that you have to say to us. And Lord, we need to walk in your grace, your mercy, and your spirit. I thank you, Lord, that we do not have to earn our salvation. Um, but Father, I also pray that we would not stray from um, the glorious gospel that you have brought us into. Uh, Lord, that we would just we would trust in the work that you have done for us and that we would walk in your grace and your mercy. And we lift all these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I went.